All right, we are live. All right, so today we're so lucky to have uh, Jackie Gallen from the Functional Canine. Now you're located in Adelaide, correct? Yeah, that's right. Okay, cool. So um, when we finish up here today, um, uh, Jackie can let us know where um, you can find her on Instagram, Facebook, and also her website as well, because I know especially some of the locals will want to be connecting with you after we have our chat, so that'll be cool. All right, so today we're going to be talking about IBD, skin issues, food intolerances, all those things that come back to an immune response, which, which is something you're quite passionate about. Now, when it comes to fresh food, you, how did you get into this? Where did it all start? I grew up, um, I grew up with a beautiful border collie, Cross Kelpie, and she was, she was always fed um, chum dog food or um, just whatever you could get from the supermarket. I'm sure a lot of people have a similar background. She um, never really went to the vet. She lived a very basic lifestyle and um, she unfortunately ended up passing away from diabetes at the age of eight. And so I thought to myself, when I get my first dog, I want to give my dog the best possible life. I'm going to give her the most high quality dry food I possibly can. She's going to see the vet on a regular basis. She's going to be wormed uh, every three months. She's going to have flea treatment every single month. Um, I'm going to pour all this money into making sure she's healthy to give her a long, um, happy lifestyle. Um, so I got my beautiful little Border Collie um, puppy at eight weeks old and um, went down to the pet shop, bought a high quality puppy dry food. It was the one that the pet shop owner highly recommended. And as soon as I gave it to her, she started constant scratch constantly scratching. Uh, she went from being constipated to having diarrhea. There was no happy in between. And she looked lifeless and dull. Her coat was dull. Um, she wasn't a healthy puppy at all. So after probably, to be honest, about two days of her being on that sort of diet, I started thinking, well, something's wrong. This isn't right. Uh, the vet didn't know yeah. the um, I, I didn't know what I could do. And that's when I started investigating and researching. And over the course of around about three to four months, I um, directed myself to a balanced fresh food diet for her. And that's wow. where, I found, where I found balance. Okay, awesome. So your passion tends to be more around sort of food intolerance, skin issues, IBD. Was she the dog that took you there or were there other dogs that you came across that really cemented that passion for you? She was my true inspiration. She was my number one inspiration. And the journey that I went on with her led me to realise that she's not the only one suffering and that there's a number of other people out there that are suffering with the same. Um, with her, I decided I didn't want to look into medication, which is why I went straight to thinking, what's the root cause of this problem? What, what should I be fixing? What's the foundation that's causing this inflammatory response? Um, and that's what I built upon. Whereas other people, they take their puppy to the vet and the vet says, your dog has, uh, your dog has irritable bowel disease please feed this prescription dry food that has no irritants in it because it's been so highly processed and put your dog on Apoquel or put your dog on uh, um, anti-inflammatory or something like that and that will make your dog better. Um, and that's a path I didn't want to go down. And some people choose to go down that path and it works. And then there are people that go down that path and it doesn't work. And most of the time, those are the people that are looking for other options. So that's what... Yeah. That I stemmed my passion and inspiration from and thought there's other people out there that just need a little bit of guidance and a little bit of knowledge because there's so much information on the internet that's partially correct, partially incorrect, conflicting, confusing, and people don't know where to mm. start. Yeah, it's, it's challenging, isn't it? And I think we, we see it as well in our own fresh food uh, feeding group is that um, you'll come across a lot of people that are really well-meaning and they have hearts of gold and unfortunately, sometimes the information isn't quite right. Um, and people trust the information and they go with it. And sometimes that can make a condition a lot worse than what it is. So, you know, that, that is unfortunate. Now, in terms of these conditions, you're going to be seeing a lot of clients that are affected by these conditions at the moment, yeah? 
why do you think we're seeing such an influx of these conditions? Because I think if we look back in time, we weren't seeing the the amount of dogs with, with these conditions. I mean, even within my own breed, who um, a, a Great Dane who is known to have really crappy digestive systems. Is your belief that it's what we're feeding? Is your belief that um, it's what we're breeding? Is it like a combination of everything? Where do you, why do you think we're seeing all these dogs that suffer? I feel that we, uh, in the way our pets live is the way we live. So a few years ago, we were eating very high processed diets mm. and same for our pets. And we thought that was the best for them. Uh, us as people are starting to realize that that's not good for us and that a whole food diet is best. Synthetic vitamins may not necessarily help us out and we need to be getting that from natural food. And now we're starting to slowly realize that that's important for our dogs. We don't eat breakfast cereal every single day of our lives. Um, we don't eat a compacted, compressed, dry cracker that has all the nutrients and vitamins added into it. We eat a variety of whole fresh foods um, to naturally get all the nutrients we need. When you start feeding a dog a, uh, a processed diet that may not necessarily have the right balance of nutrients in it, it may not necessarily have high quality ingredients in it. The proteins may be from inferior sources. Um, the nutrients may all be synthetic. There might be yeah. a higher carbohydrate load than what the dog is designed to handle. Uh, it may not be supporting its gut biome, but when you start doing all these things to your dog, its immune system is suppressed and the body starts reacting in ways that it shouldn't. You start getting a slow inflammatory response that then progresses into something that you can physically see. Your itchy skin, your loss of hair, um, behavioral problems, those sorts of things. Um, IBD, gut issues, leaky gut syndrome, uh, Part of it is breeding. Like I do definitely agree that with pure breed dogs, um, a lot of the inbreeding that goes on doesn't help. But you see um, like pound dogs and stuff like that, crossbreeds that are yeah. also affected. So I think you, you mentioned something really interesting there and it was the word slow. And I think sometimes what we see and you can, you can see it in, in, on different platforms is that someone might be feeding, for example, um, a supermarket based kibble, which in most cases is going to be a fairly low quality um, diet for a dog and and they'll look at the dog and like well they're fine they you know they're doing they're doing fine their coat is shiny and you know everything's cool and what a lot of people don't realize is that those nutritional deficiencies don't necessarily go wham hello here I am it's this slow inflammatory response that um, most people don't even realize until it just happens. You're like, where did that come from? Well, you know what? It's actually been building up over all this time and now it's actually showing you what it is. And so a lot of people can't even then look at the fact that it was most likely coming from the food that they were being fed. So I think that was a really good point that you made that the word slow because that's generally what happens. And I think people get um, very mixed up between what a allergy is and what a food intolerance is. There are very, mm. very few people that suffer from a true allergy. That's a very quick immune response that shows up within a day. Uh, you'd feed your dog, say, for example, chicken. And within the next 24 hours, your dog is scratching profusely and, you know, biting itself to it and bleeds. Um, most dogs suffer from a food intolerance, which takes a different biochemical path in the body. It's a level two or three hypersensitivity rather than a level one. And as you said, it can take days, weeks, months, or even years to show as a physical ailment. Yeah, we have um, a comment um, that has come up. How do I show this? I don't know if that's showing. Um, the comment is, that's right, it's not always the outside that we see first. So in your experiences, how are some of the other ways that um, pet owners can potentially see these inflammatory responses before they really hit? 
sometimes it can be to do with the gut. Um, as soon as your dog ingests something that it probably shouldn't, it might have an automatic reaction of diarrhea um, or constipation. That may be something that happens. Um, that can also happen normally just from a sudden change of diet. So just general health indicators, clear, clear eyes um, is a sign of good health. I find a lot of dogs that are fed on dry food have sleep in the corners of their eyes. The way your dog smells is an indication of the type of um, flora that yeah. is living on its body and in its body. So the way your dog smells is an indication, even the smell of your dog's breath. Um, people coin the term doggy breath as though it's a normal thing but it's not it shouldn't be yeah look um that's something that we hear quite a lot and I do hear it with my clients from time to time old dog breath and it's like an assumption that um old dogs shh, it's okay that they have these smelly breaths mm -hmm. and you're like well no that's that's not actually normal I mean you know especially when we're dealing with older dogs it can potentially be um, a dental health hygiene kind of issue um, but also, you know, as dogs get older and they've been on these um, lower quality diets for such a long period of time, is this now what you're seeing? Is this, you know, a reflection of what's happening inside? So I think that's a really good point is that, um, you know, that doggy breath, that, that's actually not normal. It's not. It's not at all. And with what you said relating to dental hygiene, it's almost interconnected. What's going on in your mouth is going to affect what's going on in your gut. So if you resolve the issue in the mouth through, uh, through surgery or um, something like that, you're not necessarily resolving the issue in the gut as well because it's already affected that. So you need to really work from the root of the problem to try to work out how to best stop this manifestation of disease in your animal. Yeah. Okay. So if someone um, suspects whether it's because of uh, a breath issue or they're seeing something external or maybe their dog stools just don't seem right and they suspect that there's some sort of intolerance or IBD happening, what are some things that you could suggest that they could start doing today from home? It depends on what the specific issue is. If someone has a dog that is severely itchy, the first thing you need to think about is what is causing this initial response? Uh, is there a trigger in the diet? Uh, what are you currently feeding? If you're feeding a uh, like a basic raw diet, potentially it may be one of the proteins that you're giving your dog. If you seem to notice a trigger between every time you give your dog chicken or you give your dog beef or pork or a poultry product that this inflammatory response seems to occur, remove that from the diet and remove it for anywhere between two to six weeks until you start to see a diminish in that response. Removing, yeah. um, removing legumes, grains such as corn and wheat from the diet as well. So if you're on a dry food diet, try to see what you can do to move towards a fresh food diet. Uh, yeah. And then that way removing those, sorry, <laughs> removing those <laughs> highly, processed, um, highly processed components that are not necessarily beneficial to your dog and that hinder their natural gut biome, removing those from the diet helps. And then looking to boost the natural gut biome and support the immune system would be the next step. So if you can only feed a certain dry food for whatever reason, whether it be for financial reasons, whether it be for availability reasons, because you live in the middle of nowhere and you don't have access to other things, whether it be because this is the only diet that you've been able to find so far that doesn't give your dog severe diarrhea, um, you can start adding things to that to help boost their immune system and boost the quality of that diet. Uh, things like probiotic foods, your kefir, goat's milk kefir is absolutely amazing for dogs that have intolerance. Fermented vegetables, and this is something that you can make yourself at home and it can be quite affordable and easy to make. Uh, ensuring that your dog's food has enough oils in it. Um, things like omega-3 um, and basic um, basic nutrients from a lot of dry foods dissipate into the air within five days of the bag being opened. So you want to make yeah, sure and I, that I think um, a lot of people don't actually understand that as well, is that um, fats are essential to, to a dog's diet and majority of our dry, dry foods, I, I probably feel comfortable with saying probably all of our dry um, foods are probably lacking in omega-3s. And even our homemade diets uh, can be lacking in omega-3s as well. But when we look at those dry diets, as soon as we open that bag, 
you're letting in air, you're letting in light and all these different things and heat that are going to degrade these oils, these fats um, that are going to turn rancid um, and in turn create inflammation in the body as well. But I think, um, I, I can't remember who posted it the other day. Um, actually, I think it's like a speaker for tomorrow. Um, it was more so about um, this imbalance of omega-3 to omega-6 ratios and that that's another thing that we're looking at creating inflammation in our dog's body. For instance, if, um, you know, we might have a beef kibble, what was that cow eating, you know? Because that actually affects the omega-3 to omega-6 ratio. All different animals actually have a different ratio. And if the omega-6s are way too high and the omega-3s are way too low, then I think it's impossible for um, us or our dogs to have um, an anti-inflammatory response. So um, I, I think a lot of people don't understand that. And that's why we need to be adding omega-3s into the diet to reduce inflammation in the dog's body. So I think that's a whole, uh, that's a whole different discussion. It's, yeah. Um, it is connected um, because an inflammatory response produced by the food or something like that will be controlled with a um, anti-inflammatory antioxidant or oil or something like that. Um, but it definitely, I do agree. It, there's so much to it that um, mm. yeah, can't be. It's crazy, but time. yeah, look, I think we're living right now in this area um, era of um, discovery when it comes to the gut. Um, although, you know, there's been a lot of written about it, you know, even 80, 90 years ago, but right now we seem to pay, be paying a lot more attention to it. Um, we're starting to understand how an unhealthy gut can actually affect our behaviour and our dog's behaviour as well and how it's actually related to pretty much every other response in our body. So apart from kefir and fermented vegetables, um, what are some things that maybe people could um, go to the store today and buy without actually having to make and go through that process to help the happy, I guess, the good bacteria in their dog's guts. Yeah, yeah. Um, prebiotics are amazing. And if you can, pairing a probiotic, which is your prefer your fermented vegetables, with a prebiotic, which will help feed the bacteria within that, is it amplifies the effect almost instantaneously. So if you're not able, like if you are making your own fermented vegetables and you do need to wait 24 days or if you are um, trying to make your own kefir or you can't source it where you are, then feeding small amounts of prebiotics in the diet will help. Generally, yeah. dogs with IBD, uh, if you put them on a very simple bland protein diet with about maybe one quarter to one third of uh, cooked pumpkin content, it changes their gut. It absolutely changes it. So pumpkin is very beneficial. Uh, some people do, some people in some communities do say it's too high in carbohydrates, but if it's going to work for your dog and if you're feeding it for a short space of time to help boost that gut biome and if you're feeding it in the right amounts and gradually reducing to a quantity that is appropriate for your specific dog, then that's absolutely fine. Slippery elm powder, it's probably not quite as easy to source, but that there is also absolutely amazing for any dog experiencing any gut overstimulation it uh, lines the digestive um, mucosa and it helps with anything like any sort of leaky gut problems and it also acts as a prebiotic to feed the gut bacteria to again help boost the immune system and help make things a lot better yeah i think sometimes what um, um people forget is what a prebiotic actually is and that if you want to get the most out of your probiotics you actually need to feed them um, and there's certain plant matters etc that you can you can use and I have my go-to ones what's your go-to plant matter that you use as a prebiotic I generally opt for pumpkin that's probably one of yeah. my favorites the pumpkin yeah yeah for dogs with um, higher yeast content and that have that real imbalance in their body opting for slippery elm is also um, probably more viable and you're going to see a better result with that for generally yeah. um, things like banana papaya even blueberries have a small prebiotic content to them so um, opting for those fruits will be okay you just need to make sure you're feeding them at the right time uh, with the right mix so feeding them with your probiotic or feeding them maybe an hour before or, or more before you're going to feed uh, 
high protein based diet just to allow the body to um, utilize it as it needs to. Yeah, I think you made a really good point there. And I think especially when we're in these fresh food feeding groups, there's um, certain models um, like feeding models that people like to use as a guide or even as a Bible and stepping outside of that can be really challenging for them. So when someone comes along and says, well, you know what, pumpkin would be really good in this instance and like, oh my God, it's too high carbohydrate and wolves didn't eat that many carbohydrates and things like that. And it's kind of taking a step back and going, well, let's just work with the dog that's actually in front of us right now. And we're not talking about feeding, you know, 40, 50% carbohydrates on an ongoing basis. But if this dog needs that level of fiber right now to help them, how is that a bad thing? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know? So let's um let's have a look at some questions that we've got. Let's yeah. Have a look. Okay, so we have a question and it says, what about cross generations? Grandparents and parents being fed dry kibble their whole lives, but puppies being fed healthy whole foods raw and succumbing to those inflammatory issues. And you know what, I think um, that's a really interesting um, discussion because there is um, a level of science on that. Um, there's science, I think, that actually goes both ways um, in which to say, like say with nutrigenomics, that it doesn't matter what has happened in the past, you can still go ahead um, and start to change your dog's um, response to, you know, like say if, if my Dane's parents had bad skin or they had a lot of yeast problems and things like that and now my Dane has it but if I take him off kibble and I'm feeding him a fresh food diet I give him the opportunity to change that you know we're turning on and off genes um, I think we have to also understand that there is a genetic component there as well and that's what nutrigenomics is it's actually turning on and off switches through genetics so what's your general advice to people in this situation for instance they've they've got a puppy um, it's from parents and grandparents that have been fed kibble. So there's going to be some negative immune responses there that have carried on down to this puppy. What can they do now to deal with maybe those allergies or irritable bowel syndrome to try and, I guess, change the future that has kind of been handed to them by genetics? It's all about the gut biome again. Um, the, pup yeah. gets its, the pup gets its gut biome from its mother. And if its mother yeah. has only dry food then it's almost compromising that pup's chance so you you just need to work out how you can go about um, helping that gut flora to produce as it should sometimes it's with most puppies it can be a very quick transition and they can take to raw straight away if it is a puppy that you've got and you've tried to put it on raw and it's not working for whatever reason then you need to work with a slower transition really working towards ensuring there's enough prebiotics in the diet, probably having that on a higher fiber diet if you're finding that kibble's working but raw's not, um, and then slowly building up that gut bacteria, making sure there's sufficient enzymes within your pup's body to then build towards that fresh food diet over a number of months, possibly even over the course of the year, if that is what you do need to do. Now, you're talking about enzymes. So for the people that are just new to adding fresh food to their dog's kibble, where are they getting enzymes from? Can you explain to them um, how they're getting enzymes from their fresh food and, and maybe if their dog doesn't build enough, uh, produce enough enzymes, where else can they get them? So enzymes do absolutely occur naturally within fresh food. So if your dog is, say, eight years old and it's only ever been fed dry food, its body isn't going to be functioning as it should be. Uh, when you start adding small amounts of fresh food to that dry food diet, you're adding a small quantity of enzymes. If that isn't sufficient to really help your dog move into the diet that um, ideally I would like to see your dog eating, then maybe you might need a powdered enzyme. And that is definitely something that you can add. Um, it, can be, it can be more effective or less effective than fresh foods. It, again, it depends on your dog and what, the problems and issues are if your dog has a lot of intolerances maybe you might need to opt for a powdered enzyme if there's certain foods that it can't eat if your dog yeah want foods then maybe um, seeing what you can do with fermented foods um, to help boost the gut and then be able to add more fresh foods to the diet um, to have a better enzymatic effect then maybe that's what you need to do yeah and i think that's a good point sometimes you do have to turn to an actual enzyme product 
you know some that's just sometimes what you have to do all right let's have a look at another question i get so many comments from visitors that there's no doggy smell at all here people don't realize doggy smell is not how dogs should smell at all i.e doritos paws um, that's that's a good um, comment isn't it because um, so often people go if they smell like corn chips like why do they smell like corn chips or their feet or their ears do and and what to do about it um, I think we actually had um, a post the other day from um, someone I think a Labrador owner I, I think that their dog is continuously getting yeasty ear problems if that was one of your clients you know working alongside their vet um, or whoever else that they work with, how do you work with those people who are having these reoccurring occurrences of these yeast problems? Sometimes um, sometimes people think it's just yeast. Um, I'm, I've put my dog on a raw diet and it's still got a yeast overgrowth. It's still getting these reoccurring ear infections. You need to remember that it's all about the inflammatory response that's happening internally within the body that's causing these physical effects. So, um, again, it's looking at the base diet that you're feeding. If it's a dry food diet, maybe do you need to make sure that you're not feeding wheat or corn? Um, if it's a raw food diet, is your dog allergic to chicken? Does it have an intolerance to beef? Is there another food in there that's causing an inflammatory response that's presenting itself as an ear infection? So looking at that as well as thinking what feeds yeast? The cup. Yeah, for sure. So you need to make now, sure Sorry, continue, Jackie. Oh, that's it. Yeah, you, you need to balance the two. Yeah, for sure. Now, Jackie, do you deal with cats? We have a cat question. Okay, um, I can deal with cats. They're a little bit trickier than dogs, but I can deal with cats. All right. Any suggestions for a cat-friendly probiotic, um, probiotics and probiotics? I think they might mean pre and probiotics, cat-friendly. Uh, it would depend on the issue, but um, kefir is appropriate for cats. I wouldn't feed it in large amounts because too much dairy in a cat's diet can change their urinary pH, which can develop your strobite crystals and things like that, and you want to stay right. away. So I think, again, it would depend on the cat's specific need, um, but sticking to a slippery elm powder and a goat's milk kefir would be a good starting point to help boost the cat's gut bacteria. Um, you may need to head down the path of a dairy-free probiotic powder, um, but it depends on the need, depends on the reason why you want to feed that and if it's for a long-term general health benefit use or if it's for more of a short-term boost that you want to give your cat. Okay, cool. We have a question here and um, I'm not actually familiar with the discussion that's going on in a, at the moment that they're discussing. It says, there's a massive de a debate at the moment surrounding kidney disease and heart disease due to um, improper storage of kibble. Is that something that you've been across lately? Um, I looked into something about it yesterday and it was in relation to, um, I, from what my understanding was, grain-free diets um, and improper storage causing either a block of taurine absorption in the body or... Oh, this was the Rodney Habib story, was it? Yeah. I haven't yeah. watched it yet. Yeah. I haven't had the 25 minutes yet. He blew out his 10-minute time frame. But I think I think what that's about is um, avoiding legumes where possible. Um, mm. That's my understanding and understanding as well that taurine is important to your dog. Uh, you can't just say only cats need additional taurine. Uh, you need to make sure your dog's getting taurine in their diet too. So feeding things like heart muscle or red meats um, that are yeah. taurine to help. It's yeah. actually something that we, we supplement um, my dog's diets with, um, having a Great Dane that is actually uh, prone because of their breed to cardio issues. Um, so we actually do use a taurine powder as well just to cover our bases. Um, it does make me incredibly nervous what's happened in the um, Golden Retriever um, communities, um, especially since we're still not getting, you know, the information from it that they actually really fully understand what's going on. Um, so for breeds that are prone to these heart diseases, um, it, makes me, it makes me quite nervous. So I'm, I'm always sort of making sure that, you know, my, my dogs have enough taurine. You know, it's, um, it's a bit of a worry. Exactly. All right, let's have a look. For a powder, what's your reason behind that? Is it just um, for me, um, it would be straight up paranoia at the moment. 
um, <laughs> that, that, that's pretty much where it is. If um, my Dane was younger, I probably wouldn't be concerned at all. Um, I, I'm comfortable that he's, he's probably getting enough taurine from his diet because it's quite varied. But he's actually just hit that magic at age in Great Danes, which is five. And five is kind of where shit goes down in Great Danes. And I'm just kind of, I'm kind of in my little paranoid phase at the moment. So, yeah. Yeah, I think it's just straight up paranoia. That's I think I'm just being an overprotective mama at the moment. Um, so I guess that, that's a good point as well. So if if you're dealing with people that, um, I guess like people like me who have dogs that are more prone to these these issues and they have this level of paranoia like I do, what are some of your recommendations? As in with um, like... You and you would um, bring in different foods in that are, I guess, high in taurine and, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it would, it, again, it would depend on the breed. Um, generally, a well-balanced natural diet will give almost any dog everything that they need. But you do need to be careful um, raising large breed puppies. You need to make sure they're not growing mm. too fast. Make sure you're not over-exercising them. Um, smaller dogs still need enough energy. A lot of people um, do over or underestimate the amount of energy that they need because they lose a lot of heat. Um, because they are such a small little compact unit. Yeah. So breed factors yeah. do definitely come into it, but it depends with the dog that, as you were saying before, is presented in front of you. You can't apply, apply rule A to, to Great Danes. You need to look at what does this dog need in comparison to this dog? What's going on in this dog's body that is different to this dog? So what do I need to yeah. do? Yeah, for sure. All right, another question. Or statement. Um, slippery elm bark powder is amazing. Aussies can find it at Chemist Warehouse and so on and another place. Best not to use it long term though. What's your thoughts on using slippery elm powder long term? I believe the reasoning for there to be worry around using it long term is that it blocks or deters nutrient absorption. Um, I don't really know the whole truth to that ruling. If your dog needs to have it long term because it gets severe diarrhea without it, you're losing all your nutrients anyway. So I mm. think it depends um, on working out what is an appropriate dosage for your dog and how often your dog does need it. If it's possible to wean your dog off of it, or if it's a choice between slippery arm and medication. Yeah, I I I'm not across um, a reason why you can't use it long term other than. Uh, one would hope that you're trying to find, you know, the root cause of the issue as well. But um, it's definitely something that, that I have here um, and I use it quite a bit. So especially when we're dealing with foster dogs that unfortunately when they come in, we don't have kibble in this house. Um, so sometimes they have to do a, tra a straight transition yeah. onto a fresh food diet, which can upset their tummies depending on, you know, what their constitution is like. So slippery elm powder has been um, very beneficial for us. Um, with that, let's see what else we've got here. Yeah, I think someone else was just talking about how we were saying earlier, like why are there so many conditions now? It's you know people wonder that as well. Like, you know, why are dogs so different now than what they used to be? And um, I, I think sometimes you have to ask the question: Is why are we so comfortable? Um, with being told to feed more processed food when our own human doctors are telling us to eat more fresh food why would it be so different and it, it seems really hard for people to um to come away from that and, and i think it's also because there there is a level of paranoia around the complete imbalance tag and we see it all the time with people coming into our group that feed fresh food diets and they want, uh, sorry, they, they feed kibble and they want to feed a, a fresh food diet, but they're really scared because over all these years, kibble companies have said that you need to feed a fresh food diet, a, a feed a, a complete and balanced diet, and that's in their bag. So you can't do that if you don't feed a kibble. And I think because vets don't get those teachings in university, they also don't know how to guide um, their customers on how to feed a fresh food diet that is balanced as well. Because balance from an AFCO point of view and balance maybe from our point of view is a little bit different. And I think that's where people really get quite stuck. 
how do you how are you dealing with that when with your clients who are probably really stuck coming over from the kibble world and they're so worried about adding fresh food into their diet because it might be unbalanced i'm sorry i missed that question the line cut out can you just say that again with your clients if when they're coming over from a kibble diet and they're really scared of adding fresh food or even going to a fresh food diet because they're worried that it won't be balanced how do you approach that with them it's it's all about meeting the nrc requirements and making sure that you're meeting the trace mineral requirements the energy requirements for the dog um, and if you can show that on paper and if you can say this has everything that your dry food has in it if not more um yeah if not more then then why do you need to feed a processed product um and with what you were saying about vets i think it's it is that the vets are fearful because they have people come in with puppies that have been fed just cooked beef mints and they have mm. joint problems and they're not growing properly and these vets go what are you doing you're killing your dog you feed it dry food because you have no idea what you're doing um or people who mm. walk in and say i only feed my dog chicken carcasses that's all he gets and look how healthy he is um and yeah they have vets and like you were saying all they know is there's balance in a bag. So if you're not going to be able to feed balance through doing it yourself at home, you need to feed your dog this bag because I want to stop your dog getting sick. Um, that's, mm. they know. that's why there's people out there um, like you and me that inspire people to look into how they can achieve balance naturally. It's not just throwing your dog a whole chicken every day. There's a little bit more to it than that, making sure that you're feeding mm. the right in the right quantities from the right sources. Yeah, and I think we sort of we do give vets a really hard time um, because they don't they don't often have the education in fresh food feeding. But I think sometimes we have to understand it from their point of view is that as you said, they're seeing some of the worst cases of people that are just feeding meat or meat and pasta or, or something like that. And then you are going to see growth deformity growth deformities and deficiencies later on down the track. So you can't help um, you can't help it if you were them to, to feel nervous for your clients that they're doing this. That, you know, if you can see someone is, is clearly making a mistake, you want to say something to them, right? You know? So you want to say, please don't feed your dog only chicken carcasses. That, that's really not the right way to do it. So if that's all they're seeing, I think we, we have to sort of understand from a, a vet's perspective as well that they only want what's right for you, but they can only guide you based on their education. So if their education is only in kibble, then that's the only thing that they can really talk to you about. So if you don't want to feed kibble, you need to find somebody else that's actually trained in fresh food feeding. And now what you were talking about before with NRC guidelines, so what some pet owners don't understand is that there's a few different guidelines in the world, and the main ones would be AFCO, which is kibble is created too, and then there's NRC, which is more sort of in line with fresh food feeding. And... Um, you would go with their recommended guidelines with NRC versus AFCO, which is minimum guidelines, which is pretty much, this is how much you feed of this to keep your dog alive. Where their NRC is, this is how much you feed um, to, this is a recommended, I don't want to say optimal, because I think that's very different per dog, but it's a hell of a lot higher and better than what AFCO standards are. So I think sometimes people don't understand what that difference is. And I would definitely be saying you need to find yourself someone who works in canine nutrition um, that can help guide you so you can actually be hitting these, these guidelines, the recommended guidelines. You can see improvements in your dog. And then if you can go ahead, like you just said, if you can show them to them on paper, then what are they going to say? They can take this piece of paper and actually show it to their vet to say, I am feeding a balanced diet. You know, that there's different options available as well to get your vet on side. What's your experience with dealing with, with vets and fresh food diets? How, how do you go working with them? Um, I've got a lot of friends with vets. And uh, as you were saying, I think it, le it just leads back to lack of knowledge and, you know, poor experiences that they've had with clients. Mm. So at the end of the day, um, I always have to go with what the vet says first. And if the vet is saying, no, you can't feed your dog that sort of diet for whatever reason, um, then I say to the owner, you're going to have to respect your vet's decision in that basis feed your dog that diet and add what you can to it. Um, mm. there, are, there are options if your um, animal has like a kidney disease or something, there are definitely options. Um, 
you're not necessarily supposed to see me for something like that, but there are people out there that can help you that are holistic vets, that are trained in nutrition, that will be able to say, this is what you do need to do. Um, working yeah. with a vet is really important. Um, and I think the only way you can side with the vet is understand what they've learned. Um, when I studied at uni, the nutrition that I studied was the same nutrition that the vet studied. We had one semester of it and it was all about how much dry food to feed effectively. Uh, there was one component on homemade diets and it just said how dangerous they can be. So I know, I know what vets have been taught and unless they've done any external research themselves, any external courses, unless, unless they've done anything outside of what the pet food reps come and tell them, they're not going to know. Yeah. Yeah, that's hard. It's hard to hear, isn't it? You're like, oh, that's, that's kind of painful. But it's good to hear from someone else. You've studied animal science. So it's um, it's interesting to, to hear that from your perspective as well, that you, you pretty much have done the same nutritional education at a uni level. So you, you know what they're being taught. So it's, it's interesting. All right. So our take home points today, if we have a dog that is potentially showing some sort of intolerance, IBD, skin issues, the gut is probably one of the most important things that we need to look at. And you want to be looking at probiotics and prebiotics. Now your go-to probiotic is? My go-to probiotic would probably be goat's milk kefir. Um, if your dog is experiencing a number of problems, avoid cow's milk kefir if possible. Um, if you can get goat's milk, it's so much better nutritionally for your dog and it will be less irritating. So goat's milk kefir, definitely. Um, for How do you... Um Sorry, how do you find, I, I know when we were doing, um, we swapped out the cow's milk for the goat's milk kefir at one point. I think someone's dogs have been naughty. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I've got mine baby gated out. Um, when we originally swapped over um, from a cow's milk to a goat's milk kefir, um, for both myself and the dogs, it actually created a digestive upset. Um, so I'm not sure if that's something that you've experienced before. Um, so having to clear that upset was having to do a fast of that and then slowly introduce it. So it seemed to be a lot more potent than a cow's milk kefir as well. Have you had any experience with that? Um, to be honest, I haven't, and I haven't ever heard of anybody having that. Wow. So, okay. Yeah, how interesting is that? Yeah. Yeah, um, and um, I... I thought it was strange. I'm actually on a, um, I think it's called Nourish Me. It's a, it's a Facebook group for humans about, you know, products for, for the gut and so forth. And it's something that apparently humans um, experience from time to time. So I was like, oh, maybe we were just lucky. I don't know. And maybe it was just the milk that we were dealing with at the time. It's, it's, it's hard to know. So, um, yeah, we could only, we had to really just take it back to going from a cup of kefir with a Dane down to a, a teaspoon and then just working it back up again. It seems pretty potent. So it's interesting that you haven't experienced that. Lucky me. <laughs> and um, in terms of um, raw goat's milk over goat's milk kefir, would you always go for the kefir or would you sometimes just use the raw goat's milk? I think it's really difficult for people to source true raw goat's milk. Um, it's probably mm. easier to source kefir. Uh, for a puppy, I think um, raw goat's milk is great, but if all you can get is the kefir, then I would 100% vouch for that. That is still really, really good. Um, again, it depends yeah. on access and availability, um, and I I really, really think that goat's milk kefir is an amazing, amazing product. So if you can use yeah, it, well we might try it again. We might give it another little whirl and see if we we can get some better, some better responses than we did last time. Okay, and your prebiotic of choice is going to be pumpkin. And is that a cooked pumpkin or raw pumpkin? Always feed cooked pumpkin. It helps um, with the digestion of the pumpkin because it is such a starchy vegetable. You do need to cook mm. it. Um, if you can steam it, that's great. If you can bake it, that's great. If you boil it, it will lose some nutrients, but that's not necessarily why you're feeding it. You're feeding it mainly for the prebiotic effect that it has. So um, yeah. cook it however you can, remove the skin, and then feed that with the probiotic mm -hmm. if possible. Um, around about an hour before their meal would be the best time to feed it. If you can't do mm -hmm. that, you can definitely feed it with the meal. Yeah, and the others that you were your go-to were berries and what was the, I think you said uh, bananas as well? Banana, 
Uh, yep, banana is good um, as well as papaya. But if you've got a dog that's experiencing real yeasty reactions, it's probably best to steer away from those and stick to something a little bit more simple just to start with okay. to see if if pumpkin helps. If pumpkin doesn't help, then that's where you'd look at slippery elm powder um, as more of your option would go to. Excellent. And look, I'm not by myself. Neither of my two dogs tolerated the goat milk kefir either. So maybe it's something with, with different, I don't know, different goats. Who knows? An interesting point, isn't it? I'm a little bit jealous now that you don't have that issue. It's really interesting. Okay, cool. All right. Now, is there anything else that, that you could add for, for people that are at home watching today that, that do have dogs that are showing intolerances? Yeah, um, I, I think I'd just like to let everybody know um, to start with removing what is causing the issue to start with and then adding in things that will help boost the immunity. With, um, with slippery elm powder, if that's what you do choose to add, you can add a quarter teaspoon per five kilos of dog and you mix that with a little bit of water or mix it through their wet food, depending on what type of food you're feeding. With kefir, for a small dog, you'd start off with um, a teaspoon and work your way up to a tablespoon. You might even need less than that, depending on your dog. A medium dog can have one to three tablespoons and a large dog, you'd be looking at two to four tablespoons of kefir uh, in their diet per meal. Uh, with the pumpkin, it's pretty safe to feed anywhere between one to four tablespoons, depending on what your dog needs. If your dog has very severe, severe IBD and it's on a prescription diet and that's still not really having an effect, then maybe you do need to step right back to a very, very simple cooked turkey and pumpkin diet or something similar and then look at rebalancing from there. Um, and then with your fermented vegetables, um, around about a tablespoon added to each meal, um, give or take depending on the size of your dog, um, is a good starting point. Excellent. So turkey would be your go-to? Turkey is my go-to. For some dogs, okay, that's cool. my okay, but turkey is my go-to. Yeah. Go yeah. And do you source turkey pretty easily where you are? Uh, in general, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. ah, cool. Yeah. Not something I can easily get my hands on except for at the supermarket. So yeah. I think we need to move to Adelaide. Okay. Excellent. All right. Now, if people want to catch up with you after this, if they want to come and make an appointment with you, do you also do distance work as well for those who aren't in Adelaide? I do all of my nutrition consults online. Um, a lot of it is done through email correspondence or just general conversations. I'm happy for people to message me on Facebook and I like people to tell me about their problem before I say, let's go ahead with it because it Perfect. might be something as simple as just stop doing this, that's all you need to do or just start yeah. doing this. Um, it might be something so small um, so they don't really need to go ahead with a consult. Um, I don't charge people to talk to me. They can ask me questions anytime. I'm always happy to have a conversation. And if they need a nutrition plan for whatever reason, then we can talk about going down that path. Otherwise, it just might be small little tweaks here and there that they need. Perfect. So where can people find you? Give us your website, Insta, Facebook. Yeah, um, search functional canine on Google. Um, search it on Facebook. Um, my um, website is www.functionalcanine.com um, if it doesn't pop up on Google. But, um, yeah, just search Functional Canine and I'm sure it should show up. Awesome. Jackie, thank you for talking to us today. I think um, people have really enjoyed We keep getting messages of great advice. So um, I think it's been really helpful today and some really just common sense information for people to really take on board. So. Thank you so much for joining us and, and thank you for being in our group as well and, and joining in and, and helping people wherever you can. All right. All right. We'll let you carry on with your afternoon. Um, I'll just quickly see if there's anything more. I think we're going to be okay for now. All right. Let's let Jackie go. Thanks, Jackie. I'll see you later. Thank you.